Tonight's going to be great. If you don't know, tonight is a Q&A. It was a series of messages that was all about politics. We talked about a lot of different topics. If you weren't here, we talked about stuff like abortion. We talked about things about like homosexuality. We talked about church and politics. We talked about racism. A lot of different things that you see. And we talked about, pastors spoke on what the word of God says about those issues. Tonight, we did have some questions come in. I'll be hosting tonight. I'll be over here on the side. But you're also going to see a number right here pop up right there. It's going to pop up any second right there. Here comes the phone number right now. Everybody say right now. There it is. There you go. You can text those questions right there. If you didn't send in a question, that's a phone number. It will go right to me. Don't worry. Even if I have your number, you remain anonymous. If you want to tell us who you are afterwards, that's on you. But you can text your questions, and we're going to start with questions that have already come forward. But you can be texting in your questions as we go on through the night. I can't promise that we're going to get to them, but I promise you that we will try. So feel free to do that. So as we get ready, we're going to go ahead and start with tonight and I'm going to get my notes out right here on our phone. And uh, first of all, Pastor, can you pray for us for tonight? Absolutely. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for uh, allowing us to gather tonight. And Lord, we come, uh, Lord, under your banner, we come to glorify your name. I pray, Lord, that all that is said and done, first and foremost, would bring honor and glory, Lord, to your name, God, that it will uh, illuminate our hearts. God, instruct us as to what your word says, God, on some of these controversial issues. I pray your blessing, Lord, upon all that's going on on campus tonight. We pray, uh, we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, Pastor, since you prayed, there's actually a question that came in, and I directed you earlier. This is going to be one I think would be great for you. This is the question. It's kind of long, but uh, deal with me here. It says, I know that by saying this, a lot of religious or not religious people won't agree, even if those who have had abortions. But my question or my comment is the following. What is the difference of being in favor of an abortion if the mother's life is in danger, that's okay, but against one of a woman that finds out that the child is going to have a, a defect and will never have a normal life? I say this since I'm in favor of getting an abortion in these cases. One baby and, um, and many millions will have somebody um, that really will take good care of them. This is a great burden for some parents, even Christians, and those children may, in many cases, may be treated wrongly. What right do we have to condemn to somebody that kind of life? That has nothing to do with selfishness. It's a cruel fact. Also, the support of abortion when poor young girls, when somebody is raped and chooses abortion. Is this something uh, that is okay with the thinking? And in the Bible, it talks about that God ordered to kill the Egyptians firstborn, even innocent, healthy babies. So why is it different in these cases? That's a, that's a great question. It's a long question. First of all, in the book of Exodus, when the, God ordered the death of the firstborn, they weren't, they weren't babies in the womb. They weren't all babies. Some of them were adults. So let's, let's get that clear. When he ordered the, the death of the eldest, the firstborn. You know, when we talk about abortion, abortion is a very, a very divisive, very controversial topic. And there are two extremes. One extreme says that, you know what, uh, uh, abortion on demand, you know what, abortions should be allowed up to the third trimester, up to moments before birth. And there are people that they swear by that, and they believe that's what it should be. You have the other extreme that say there should be no abortions whatsoever under any circumstances. So those are two extremes, and uh, I, am, I am against both of those extremes. I, I tend to want to fall in the middle. And what does that mean? That means that uh, there are, actually there are 40% of Christians when surveyed, 40% of Christians believe, do not believe in abortion, but they do agree that under certain circumstances, abortions should be allowed. And they believe that and nobody's going to change their mind. One of the problems with this discussion is how we use the word abortion. You know, the medical field uses the word abortion different than the way we use it. The medical field, when they do, it, uh, it has to do with anything of taking the baby that's not natural, taking the baby from the womb. In the medical field, that is called an abortion. Whether it be a, a miscarriage, whether it be uh, the baby dies in the womb and they have to take the baby out, in medical terms, that is an abortion. I don't think anybody would ever say, well, no, we shouldn't be doing that, you know. But we don't use that word that way. So my answer to that is, listen, at the end of the day, you're going to have to make choices. 
You know, the Bible, I, I think we all agree that people that have abortions for, for, you know, it's an inconvenience, you know, it's an economic problem, it's a form of birth control. You know what, I think most of us uh, that are Christians would agree abortions shouldn't be had for those reasons. I do think that most of us also agree in the medical field, and I don't have time to get into all of this, but in the medical field, they have certain reasons why they would recommend it uh, that are not those. Uh, but the good news is that less than 1% of the abortions today are to save the life of the mother. Less than 1% of the abortions today are because of rape or incest. Very small amount. The majority, sadly to say, the majority of abortions today are people that just don't want to be inconvenienced. You know what? Don't want to have children. And to that, I would say, you know what? The Bible is very much against that. What I would say to you is you need to be informed. You need to know what the Bible says. And I try to inform you what the Bible says. And at the end of the day, you have to make that decision. You know, one of the questions that I've been asked is, listen, if one of your daughters or one of your granddaughters were to get pregnant and they came to you, would you encourage them to have an abortion? Absolutely not. Now, what that means is, if I'm going to encourage my, well, not my daughters are grown up now, but my, I have two granddaughters, if they were to come and I say no, you know, then I have to step up and help, amen? You know, I'm very much against people laying down the law and being very dictatorial about what should happen, but you know, they wash their hands and they say, I want nothing to do with it. I, I, I believe we need to step up and help. As a matter of fact, we need to step up and help for the many courageous young ladies that are choosing to not have abortions. And a lot of them are not having abortions, even though their parents, their boyfriend, their husband, you know, society saying you should, they're not, and they need help. And if anyone should stand up, it's the church. And there are some organizations out there that we're looking into wanting to partner with to helping some of these young girls, you know, help them with diapers, help them with birthday parties, you know, what help them with encouragement, help them with counseling. I think that if we're going to take a stand against anything, I think that we need to be a part of the solution and part of the answer and not just be judgmental and critical. So to that question, I agree that some people have the right to say, you know, under these circumstances. And, and I know there's several. There's about three, four major medical reasons that doctors will 100% uh, recommend, you know, what, aborting the baby. And, uh, and, and if you do the research, you'll find in the medical field, there are some, and they're very legitimate, very legitimate. So, so that is my answer. But basically, no, no abortions. Uh, you know, just because we, uh, we take that stand, we have to be very careful with that. I hope that helps. I would agree with Pastor um, on that. We talked about it earlier, but I just want to let you guys know that there's a couple of organizations. One is called Preborn. Um, we can have some information if you guys want more information, and it will be coming to you guys. They pay for ultrasounds for women to be able to see their baby alive in their womb, and then they think they believe uh, they help them for like up to two years after their child is born with clothes, diapers, birthday parties, support. And another one I think is Love Life as well. That's another organization. But just like what Pastor said is um, as these young ladies or any woman is faced with that decision, whether she has support from family members or a husband or whatever, the church should be right there supporting them, loving on them, and not condemning them for what has happened, but hopefully encouraging them to um, and supporting them to bring new life into this world. And I just want to chime in a little bit. Um, there's a lot of cases that people could have easily aborted their kid because of whatever reason, and thank God they didn't, right? You probably know people that, I'll speak for myself, I was adopted, and you may, may or may not have heard my story, but I was born, I, first of all, I'm a twin, so even if it was a healthy pregnancy, there's already complications that could happen as a twin. You're going to probably be born a little bit smaller than the other one because you're sharing everything. Well, we were born three months early, and not only that, but my parents were addicted to drugs. So I was born, that baby you see on the commercial, shaking. I was addicted to heroin as a newborn. I was one pound. I was the size of a hand. And the doctor said that we should have died. And if we lived, we were going to have every problem that you could possibly think of. And we had tubes. I'm telling you, I don't know how I'm a musician. Thank God, because I can barely hear sometimes. I had tubes in and out of my body, especially my ears. I've had so many surgeries. Wake up with blood every time in my ears. I had a lot of problems growing up. And my crackhead parents, if I could say that, probably in their not sound mind, 
probably in most cases would have aborted them just because of their health as well. But thank God they didn't. And so in so many cases, people abort a child because they think they're going to come out with issues. Or maybe the doctor said the chromosomes are different and, you know, and they are going to come out maybe with Down syndrome, maybe with something else. And immediately people don't want to take that on. You know, we have, we have people that we know that have Down syndrome and they are the loves of our lives, right? And uh, I don't want to look anywhere, but there's even a special friend that we have in here that, thank God, he is here. Thank God that nobody let him go. And you've seen him on stage, and we love this guy. My wife works for a school that has nothing but autistic kids. And those are, and yes, are they a handful? Absolutely. They are hard to deal with, but she loves them. And you can, man, their heart for them is unlike anything else. So there's no... You know, just to, like Pastor said, just to abort a baby because you want to, you can't handle it financially or because maybe there's a report that maybe the baby's going to come out with stuff. Like Angie said, hey, then, like me, let somebody adopt them. I had parents, my, thank God my parents who were, you know, on drugs, they had some sort of a sound mind to say, we can't take care of these sick babies because we were sick for years. But they gave us to a family who took care of us. And thank God, because years later, now many of us are here. And we could say, good thing the Lord spoke to somebody to save our lives. So yeah. I just wanted to chime in on that. Yeah, good job. On that note, 10% uh, 10 uh, 10 of the chromosome tests are not accurate. So you need to know that. 80% of the ultrasound uh, tests are not accurate. They, they lack. So sometimes we depend on that to make decisions. And thank God that some people say they don't listen to that because they're wrong most of the time. Angie, were you saying, were you t can you tell us what you, what you oh, mentioned yeah. to me? So, when I was pregnant with my son, um, he was some little being that we prayed for. We wanted a son. And when I found out I was pregnant with him, uh, they did an ultrasound. And then they told us that um, something was wrong in the ultrasound. Something in his brain was there that shouldn't be there. There was a dark spot. So they sent me for more testing, so I had to go to a specialist, and when, they went, when we went to the specialist, it was kind of crazy because they're kind of heartless. You're sitting in there in like a table, and they're just like checking off, they're looking through the ultrasound, and they're like, right arm, right arm, right leg, the right leg. They're just like making sure all the body parts are there. So the doctor came in, and he was like, um, we didn't do the, te the, the chrome testing, the chromosome testing, so he told us, well, it looks like there's still something wrong, something towards the base of his neck. Um, we want to do an amniocentesis. Um, by this point, I was about six months, and um, it's a risk of miscarriage if they do that. So we decided, no, we don't want to do that. We're going to just believe God for um, our son. Whatever he was going to send our way, he was going to be our son. And Noah was born screaming with a perfect head, a, not a perfect kid, but, but he was, <laughs> those of you guys who know him know, but healthy. I mean, and so it was, we were told that he had a potential to have Down syndrome, and um, the doctor was almost kind of cruel to me when I wouldn't do the test. He was like, fine, kind of like, get out of my office then. And, um, but we just believed, and, and God did, did a miraculous, I mean, even if it was there, it wasn't when he was born, and he's a normal, healthy, crazy kid now. So I'm glad I didn't do any testing or anything. Good. Good and, and, nowadays they, and nowadays, especially in certain states, they like just want to recommend abortion all day, whether something's wrong or not. You see that on the news, and it's almost like trying to, and put fear in the moms and put fear in the parents of something. I shared the story with the staff. Brother Rufus sat down with me a couple of weeks ago and he said a young lady who was by their house, she was crying and so they prayed for her. And she was nine months pregnant, he said. And a couple of weeks later, he prayed for her because she was crying. He didn't know why. But then a couple of weeks later, she's walking with her baby and Brother Rufus says, oh, is that the little bundle of joy? And she starts crying and comes up to him. And she said, the reason I had you pray for me, because she asked him to pray a couple weeks back, is she said, the doctors were telling me that I need to abort the baby because if I don't, I'm going to die because she had so many things wrong. Well, she didn't listen to the doctor. She had faith in God and what she believed. And she made it through the birth and there was no complications at all. And now her and her baby were alive. And thank God she didn't give in to the fear that was trying to be put inside of her. So, you know, in certain states, you got to be careful with that. Like, and, like Angie and Pastor said, sometimes these things aren't even real. And for, yeah. you know, the Amen. devil and people sometimes. Amen. I think, uh, let me, the, on abortion, wh whatever you believe, uh, I want you to know that God loves you and God doesn't condemn you. I think as Christians, we need to give people grace 
We don't need to uh, shame people or make people feel guilty or make them feel that's the unpardonable sin and there's no hope for them. I think as a loving community, we need to extend the love of Jesus Christ to all people regardless of what they've been through. You know, and a lot of young girls, you know, I was in the education system and back when I was in the education system, a young girl could go to the nurse without the parent's permission and tell her I'm pregnant and the nurse could take her to an abortion clinic and have an abortion without the parents knowing. You know, 15, 16 year old girls, I can imagine the trauma And I would imagine a lot of them grow up later on and say, man, I regret that. And they feel guilty. So listen, we pray for them. We love them. We believe in God's grace. We extend the grace of God to them. Amen. Very good. So another question that came in that's great. Uh, Vic Jr., we're going to ask you this one. It says, why aren't other sins like gluttony, fornication, adultery, taken as seriously as sexual sin, especially homosexual sin? Well, that's a good question. Um, uh, well, from God's perspective, when you look at those sins from God's perspective, sin is sin, right? So um, there's no difference. But I think the reason why you see the church uh, have special attention towards homosexuality or even a sin like abortion is because they're, they're like, they're nor- they've been normalized by society and society tells you that they're okay. So in other words, like other sins like lying, uh, even though people ain't religious, nobody's pushing that lying's good or that, so that you know, being people that are lying and conniving, that that's good for society. Uh, nobody believes that. Uh, drunkenness, even in the society that we live in, nobody's promoting drunkenness. Like, they're not saying that being drunk and living a lifestyle is okay. So you don't see that much pushback, but you do see, you know, homosexuality being pushed as okay. And I think that's why the church takes the stance that it does and why that becomes more of a focal point. But I, I, and, and then I think, too, as Christians, we, we, we don't necessarily handle that the best because there are some Christians that hate people of that community. And they think that they're justified by doing that. And, uh, or they feel that it's okay to be unkind to those people or to be somehow disrespectful to those people, that somehow you're justified and uh, I, I, that, I think that adds to the problem. Uh, but I think that's why, uh, you know, from God's perspective, sin is sin. But I think when you see, uh, you know, the question is, why, are, why aren't other sins not as bad? They are. I just think you get more focal and you get more attention from the church because these things are promoted as okay. When, when we understand that, number one, it is a sin, the word speaks against it, and it's just not good for society. I mean, we, we just, we know that from history. We just, we understand that. Part of that said to um, sexual sin. So it's the same thing that Vic was saying. Like if you look around culture now, like sex has been so normalized. It's ev- it's everywhere. It's in your commercials for food. It's just all around us. So it's so normalized and it makes it seem like it's just okay to um, be that way, to just not honor what God made sex to be. So it's just, you know, it, society just trying to make it normal, I think is why, like, again, the Christian perspective is trying to take a stance on it and trying to trying to hold the fort I guess if you will when it comes to that because you know we're trying it's hard as a Christian to not let yourself blend into culture and not let culture blend into the church in the sense of allowing and and being so accepting of those things that you're kind of like well it's okay versus we love people but it's not okay on that same note Angie a question that came in and um since you kind of hit on it, it says, is sex outside of marriage okay if you are in love and want to get married? Side note, can you also touch on soul ties? Oh, in love. In love covers everything, right? Mm. So from the human perspective, it seems reasonable to think that it is okay for a couple to be like, well, we're going to get married so we can go ahead and have sex anyways, right? But God's word is, has a clear and direct command on this topic. So if we look in Hebrews 13, 4, it says, Let marriage be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. So first of all, yes, you're getting ready to get married. And not to burst anybody's bubble, but there's no guarantee that that happens until it happens. So you can be planning to get married, and you don't know what's going to happen from the moment that you're planning to when you really walk down the aisle. So you can break up. Somebody could pass away. Many different things can happen, and now you have sex, and now you're there. Um, Also, you can start to doubt the person that you've um, had premarital sex. Once you've crossed that line, it might change your view on them because 
you were headed down a path, you were going to wait, and all of a sudden there's a mind change that it's okay. Um, you can begin to question their spirituality or even your own because um, maybe this was something you prayed about together. You were like, yes, we're hardcore. And as the time gets closer, you kind of think, oh, well, does it matter? It does matter. Um, and simply having marriage plans for your future doesn't give anybody the right to disobey God's clear commands in Scripture. If you are planning to get married, congratulations. Um, but premarital sex is a temptation for every engaged and dating couple. So you need to be, you have precautions. Be committed to walking in the spirit. Um, think about your wedding plans. Think about God's goodness as a couple. But do not think about how to gratify your desires because that's giving into our desires. In Romans 13, 14, it says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its um, desires. But just to, to those who have engaged in premarital sex, there is hope and forgiveness in Christ. So if you confess our sins, he will, forget, he will forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's found in 1 John 19. So I would encourage you, if you're thinking about it and you think it's a good idea, it's not. If you've waited this long, why not wait longer? Why not honor each other in that um, beautiful setting that God has made for you and um, in any way? So not engaging in any kind of um, premarital sex of any sort. Um, keep yourself pure, and I promise you that God will honor that. He will honor your marriage, and your bond will be stronger because of it. Um, as far as the soul ties, I'm going to hand that off to Pastor Victor <laughs> for that. Yeah, the, the idea of soul ties is the idea, I mentioned it on Sunday. You know, when you have sex with somebody, you're giving them a piece of yourself. You are uniting your soul to them. and You're getting a piece of you, and you're going to carry that piece with you all of your life. And that piece of that other person is going to interfere in, in, in your life, you're going to carry that. You're going to, you know, you're going to, you're going to compare. You're going to, you know, not forget. Sometimes you're going to, I mean, it's, it's going to get crazy. So to not have those soul ties so that you can have intimacy with the person you marry, it's best that you wait. You know, that's why I'm of the belief. I tell people, listen, if you're engaged, if you're going to get married, don't have a two-year engagement. That's trouble. You know what? You're going to you commit to another. You're going to get married. You know what? Five months, six months, the latest. Get married so that you don't get tempted. Amen. Because it's very tempting. Amen. But soul ties are very powerful. You don't want to, you know, the Bible says, that, you know, Jesus said, don't you know that when you are immoral, you are, you are using your, you're giving your body, which is the temple of God. And uh, the Bible discourages that. Be very careful. Otherwise, it's going to haunt you the rest of your life. Just to give you a quick verse, in this Proverbs 1.10. It says, my son... If sinners entice you, do not consent. So be careful. Don't be enticed. And uh, like Pastor said, as far as the soul ties, and yeah, I agree, right? You don't want to live your life in comparison and just not knowing what you could have had. That could have just been beautiful between the two of you. So true. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you, right? Guess what? The devil tries to bring those things into our life that, that are meant for good. Food. He tries to bring sex. He's tried to bring different stuff, uh, you know, into your life that are meant for good, but he brings it in in such an evil way towards with temptation. And even in temptation, the Bible says to resist it. Resist the devil. He'll flee. Pastor said it on Sunday with this message. Let's be honest. Straight talk tonight. Sex is a good thing. Sorry, close your ears if you want, but sex feels good. There's, nobody's going to want something that feels bad, but God meant for it. It's just honest, right? God meant for it for a husband and wife, for you to enjoy that. Guess what? When you're married, there's only one person in the world, one person in the world that can give you what's right when it comes to that, and it's your husband or your wife. Nobody else in the world can give you that, what God has blessed, except for your husband and your wife. And, you know, I think about, you know, earlier we talked about the different sins and, you know, all the, you know, think about a brownie. A brownie tastes good, Vic, but we all know we shouldn't be eating the brownie or it's going to end up being bad. Well, like Angie said, if you're thinking, hold on, I'm going to change that. You know you're thinking about sex if you're a young person. If you say you're not thinking about it, you're lying. It's just the truth. We were all thinking about it at a young age, and even in our older ages, we still think about it. But it's not right, because God would, gave it to us for a good thing for your husband and your wife. And, I mean, we got teenage kids, and we're always encouraging, you know, them, you know, hey, wait. Because for those, you know, I'll admit it, I had sex before marriage years ago when I was young. I was stupid like most of us were. And all of us at our older age, we look back and say, man, 
Don't we just regret that? I wish I would have waited. I wish I would have did this and that. And so, of course, we try to encourage the kids, wait. Why? Take in the wisdom that we're trying to tell you. But again, that goes for not just the young people. You might be in here in your 30s, 40s, 50s, and you may not be married, and that's still going to cross your mind too. But it all comes back to what the Bible says on it. These are some hard topics, but they're good. I'm glad these questions are coming in. Let me say something else, uh, how weird this can get. I had a, a guy once come into church, and uh, he comes. He calls me one day. He said, you know, Vic, I, I love the church, you know, gave my life to Christ, but I can't go to church anymore. I go, why? He goes, because there's a lady that I had an affair with. <laughs> And I'm like, and I can't go anymore. This was a long time ago. Stop trying to figure out what I'm talking about. You know, and, and, and that was crazy. That's sad that that had to happen. But that happens. All right. But just my reminder is love doesn't cover it. Love is not an excuse. You defining that we love each other is not the reason why. The word of God says so. And again, I just want to remind you that if you already have and you, you messed up or it wasn't even your choice, that God loves you, he forgives you, you just confess your sins, um, but again, God loves you, so please don't think that it has to be something that you're stuck in or that you might as well do because you've already done it, so you might as well keep doing it. No, that's not what God wants for you. He wants to give you a fresh start, and he wants to love you and help you honor your marriage when it comes to that time, if it comes to that time. As we were speaking, a question just came in on this topic, so I'm just skipping ahead to this one. It's good. It says, if your sexual purity was taken from you, does it decrease your value in marital intimacy? That's a good one. I would say absolutely not. That was something, if it's taken from you, that's not something that you chose to do. And unfortunately, that has happened to many people, that it's taken from you. And the enemy will lie to you and will have you believe that it was something that you did. It was something that's wrong with you. It's something that it's all your fault. It's not. God loves you and it breaks his heart that it happened to you. It breaks my heart to hear that it happened to you. But, um, but please know that that's not something that God judges you on. And um, I also believe, too, if you're praying and, and waiting for that person, that God's going to send you the right person that will be understanding and loving and um, love you moving forward in that intimacy and marriage. Just to kind of touch on that with value, you know, you're worth what someone's willing to pay for you. And, uh, you know, God gave his only son for you. And so if, uh, if you question your value, he paid a very expensive price for you. So you're extremely valuable. All right, next question. Pastor Mike, I'm going to give this one to you. This one's regarding race. This one says, I'm not racist. That says enough. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not racist, but I don't like how any race can act immaturely or quote-unquote ghetto because of the culture they were raised in. Is that wrong of me? So it's regarding any race acting immaturely or ghetto because of the culture they were possibly raised in. Well, first of all, there's immature... Is it on? Is the green light on? First of all, there's immature people in every race. Every race. But the term ghetto is a type of stereotype. It's a very judgmental, condescending term. And I'm of the opinion that using that term to describe anyone's behavior is wrong. Pastor, you hit on that the other day as well when you talked about it. You described what a ghetto was, like Pastor Mike said, and that was a big deal because so many, I know I grew up, if I can say, in the ghetto, in San Bernardino, and that's what we called it. We said, why are you being ghetto? Why are you, you know, that was a word that we just used all the time, and you explained it greatly the other day, and you know, when I heard uh, uh, actually a businessman say this one time, he said, you wonder why you don't get the jobs. You wonder why you don't get certain things because whether you're 15 or you're 40 or 50, you can tell just the maturity of somebody by the way they're walking into an interview by how they're dressed. It doesn't matter how you were raised, and I guess maybe it does, but, you know, that, that was certainly something that we dealt with. Yeah, you know, Elvis Presley sang a song in the ghetto, amen, that I like. Uh, <clears throat> How do you know that, Pastor? Because I love kidding. Elvis, amen. I listened to I Elvis, Elvis growing up. You know, the term ghetto actually was a term that was uh, coined by the Germans. And it was communities. It was poor communities in Germany. 
And what they did is when they started to the plan, the final solution to eliminate the Jews, the first thing they did is they moved them from their nice neighborhoods into ghettos, which were poor areas. And then from the ghettos, they moved them to the concentration camps. And then from the concentration camps, they moved them to the death camps. Uh, but but ghettos, ghettos is a term that refers to a, a bad area. It's a term that, that we use, you know, uh, but, but, but listen, we honor people, uh, regardless of where they come from, you know. Uh, all of us, the majority of us, came from the wrong side of the tracks. I grew up in a ghetto, and uh, I didn't appreciate when people treated me because of my color or because of where I was raised, that some way, somehow, something was wrong with me or I was inferior. We need to be careful that we're not doing that. Sure. Uh, another race question, Vic. This would be a good one for you. Uh, this is regarding race. It says, do we stand with Black Lives Matter and or against the white privilege stance? <clears throat> yeah, those are uh, Black Lives Matter. You know, that's a that's a sensitive topic. And I, I think the thing that I'll tell you is that, you know, Black, Black Lives Matter means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, if you talk to people, some people view it, it depends on what your position is, you know, um, on how you view that. But um, if you my suggestion to you would be to do your homework on Black Lives Matter. You know, go find out what they stand for, what they're about, what their values are. And if you know the word of God, you can you can. You can vet it up against the word of God and see if those things line up with the word of God. And that's what I would suggest you do with Black Lives Matter. You know, the concept, yes, absolutely. Do Black Lives Matter? Absolutely they do. You know, do I agree with the concept? Absolutely. Uh, absolute, all lives matter to God. Uh, God, oh, there's only one race. There's the human race. So, you know, when we talk about these things about do we support Black Lives Matter or do we stand with these things, you know, our, our focus as Christians should really be on pointing out where legitimate concerns over race and equality stand. Now, that's what we should be focused on. I don't think we should be focused on so much uh, groups that we support, but we should be focused on, you know, if there's any inequality, anybody that's being treated unfairly, that's something that we as Christians should be concerned about, and that's something that we should stand up for. Uh, but, you know, my suggestion to you when it comes to Black Lives Matter is, is do, do your homework on Black, on Black Lives Matter. Go, don't, don't listen to what people tell you, what the media tells you. You go research their stance. They have a website. They'll tell you exactly what their values are, and what they stand for. And then you vet that against the word of God and, and you make a decision for yourself whether that's something that you support. Amen? That's good. Pastor, here's one that came in. Uh, it says, how should a parent respond if their child tells them that they are pregnant or if they come out to, if they come out to the parent that they're homosexual? Well, well, first of all, on pregnancy, on, on, by, on both of them, I, I think our response should be one of love, not one of shaming, not one of mistreatment, uh, not one, of course, of physically abusing them, but uh, to love them. I think that's the number one, that's the number one thing for, for, for either of them. Uh, I think when our kids come out to us, first of all, they come out to us, that's amazing. It's amazing that they would have enough confidence to come and tell us. Most of the time they will not. They'll tell other people and you'll hear it from somebody else because they don't have the confidence to come to us. I, I would say, the first thing I would say is, you know what, thank you for coming and telling us. Not that I'm proud of you, not that I'm happy you did it, but thank you that you know we love you and we care for you and we will always be there for you. Nothing's ever gonna change that. Uh, you know, and I, I think that's important. And I think we have to help them, help them through this process, support them. They're, they're scared. Uh, they don't. They don't know what's going to happen. As a matter of fact, I want, why don't you put up the stats? I, I, I have some stats on the on LGBTQ, um, and 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 you need to know this. Uh, according to the latest studies uh, that have been put out by the Center of Disease Control, 25% of Gen Z generation. You know, Gen Z is the newest generation born between 1997 and 2012. They are currently between nine and 24 years old, and there's nearly 68 million of them. 25% of those identify as, as gay or queer or whatever term, transgender. You know, of those 25%, of those, of those millions, 25% uh, of them have tried to commit suicide in the last year. In other words, uh, they're struggling. Uh, they have mental crisis, and it's very dangerous. And how we respond, my concern is, I don't want to see kids committing suicide because, you know what, they're gay or transgender or because even if they're pregnant, that's not a reason. But I think sometimes the way we deal with it sort of makes them think that's the only answer. 
you know what, the only solution is take your life. The only solution is check out. You know, so uh, it's, it's very dangerous. So let me give you some suggestions, especially when it comes to the LGBTQ plus uh, society. Okay, uh, the first thing I, I want to say to you is pray. Pray and fast for your children. You know what, go to God. As Christians, that's a powerful weapon. The second thing that I want to encourage you to do is don't pretend it's not happening. In other words, don't ignore the issue. Sometimes things like abortion or, or pregnancy or, or our children coming out transgender, you know what, we want to act like it's not real. Don't know, don't face it. The best way to deal with this is face it head on. You know, and, and when they come to you, as I, as I said, you know, I reassure them you're going to love them. Nothing that your kids can ever do is going to eliminate your love. It's like God. God doesn't stop loving us because we messed up. God loved us before we were sinners. The Bible says that, you know what, while we were yet sinners, God, Christ died for our sins. You know what, let them know you love them and you will always love them. You know, I, you've heard me say this before. I mean, if my girls, uh, you know, I got three girls. If they were to grow up and been prostitutes, I still would have loved them. Every night I would have gone out looking for them. You know what, I wanted to say, that's what you want, tough. I, they would come and I would let them know, you know, I'm not, I'm not celebrating your choices, but I love you. And of course, you know, the other thing you don't want to do is beat up your kids. Don't use the Bible. Don't beat them up with the Bible. You know what, don't verbally shame them. And I, I think that happens sometimes. And, and don't minimize it either by saying, you know, it's a phase. It's going to be over soon. Well, the pregnancy ain't going to be over soon. And the LGBTQ, that, that might not be over soon, soon. And what you definitely don't want to do is don't tell them. Don't tell anybody. You know what happens? Our girls get pregnant. We go and hide them. We send them off to Mexico or, you know what, with grandma in Arizona or somewhere. Or, you know what, don't tell anybody you're gay or you're, you're confused or you have this, you know, gender dysphoria. No, no, don't do that. And I'll tell you why you don't want to do that, because inside they're dying. They need to tell somebody. They need to talk to somebody. And they're going to tell, they're going to tell, people are going to know. So it's better that they tell you, that they talk to you, and better than anyone else. The other thing I want to say to you is uh, refuse to make your child's acknowledgement about you. In other words, what they go through is not your fault. You know, when our kids, our girls get pregnant or our, our, our boys or girls come out, what did I do wrong? And we start beating ourselves up. Listen, mom and dad, don't beat yourself up. It's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. For whatever reason, they have made those choices. The only thing we do wrong sometimes is that we don't talk to our kids about sex. We don't, you know, it's a taboo. We just don't know how. We need to instruct our boys and our girls and talk to them. Guys, Start teaching them. You respect girls. This is what you got to be. Girls, be careful with the boys. They're, you know, they're going to lie to you. They're going to tell you all beautiful kinds of stuff. But you need to know how to resist that. Talk to them about what happens. You know, and, and I'm not suggesting that you go and get them birth control. Some people say, well, I took him and got birth control. That's not what I'm suggesting. Just talk to them. And then also, you know, comfort your kids without compromising. You know, and all of this, I'm not asking you to compromise your values. That's not what this is about. I'm talking to you, accept them. You don't have to approve. You definitely don't have to celebrate, but just let them know that you love them. And then the ninth thing is that help your child not define themselves uh, by their sexuality. They're not a failure because they got pregnant. They're not a mess because they got pregnant. You know what, they're, they're not gay. You know what, our, our identity is, I'm not, I'm not gay, I'm not heterosexual, I'm not Hispanic, I'm not, I am a child of God, that's what I am. Yeah, and you know, that's very important. And then number 10, you know, when you hear these things, we want to make rash decisions. You know what that means? We want to go and, you know, see, even though you don't believe in abortion, when your 14, 15, 16 year old daughter comes, first thing you think is we got to get rid of this baby. Don't make rash decisions. You know, the other with LGBT, you know, right away is, well, let's go and see what's happening with you. I'm really appalled at the number of kids, 9, 10, 11 years old, that are identified as transgender. And the parents are already starting them on hormone treatments and talking to the doctor about changing their gender. I think that is so ridiculous. And, and you know what's interesting? Uh, this has been going on for a while. To your surprise, a lot of them that have had sex changes and gone through these hormones, they're coming out of it and saying, that's the biggest mistake I ever made, and they regret it. And then uh, number 11 is uh, come up with a game plan. What are you going to do next? Okay, your daughter's pregnant. What are you going to do, hide her? Okay, your, your son daughter came out. What are you going to do, act like it's not happening? No, come up with a plan. Discuss it as a family. How are we going to deal with this? How are we going to share this with our family? How are we going to share this with our friends? Because we cannot act like it's not happening and we cannot be ashamed of them 
And I cannot be ashamed of myself because I did nothing wrong. We love them. And, you know, you'd have to have a talk about that. What, what should we do? Get some counseling. You know what? And so that's number 12. Get some counseling. Get some support. Uh, you know, with help. These are very difficult uh, things to face by yourself. You don't have to face it by yourself. I put at the end there, there are two recommendations, two books uh, uh, that I would recommend. And the first one is called When, Ch when Children Come Out, A Guide for Christian Parents. Uh, Mark Yard Yardhouse, you could take a picture of that. Uh, the other one is When Homosexuality Hits Home, What Do You Do With Loved Ones? When Lo Loved Ones Say I'm Gay by Joe Dallas. Joe Dallas is one of our pastors, one of our ministers from Newport. And he has come to speak to our pastors. And one day I'm going to have him come to the church. A great guy, lived a homosexual lifestyle for many years, has been married now for 30 years, has, um, has uh, children, has written many books, travels around the nation talking on this subject. But listen, that happens, you deal with it. Don't run from it. With God's help, we're going to overcome it. Amen. And sometimes people can think the church or the pastor or somebody doesn't care. One question. He gave you 12 points and two book recommendations. Little, little sermon. That's right. That guy cares about you. Amen. <laughs> we're, we're about to close pretty soon, but I have a couple questions. And I'm, we're going to do a... I forget what it's called, but we're going to do some 30... Popcorn. We're going to do some 30-second answers. I don't know if these preachers can give you a 30-second answer, but I'm going to test them right now, folks. So, Pastor Mike, we're going to go around the horn with a few questions, and we'll see if we get all the way back around. But, Pastor Mike, this one says, how do you feel, and the church feels, about that Carl's Jr. has a Diablo burger sold for $6.66? It's highlighted the mark of the beast. How do you feel on the burger? Do you eat it, or do you go to Chipotle instead? I don't go to Carl's. He doesn't go to Carl's Jr. I go to Ten In and seconds. Out. In and Out. There you go. <laughs> There's the answer right there. Good enough for me. Vic, this one says, why do some Christians think it's okay to drink? They'll preach about Jesus but continue to do that habit. They say it's not written in the Bible, and in my defense, I respond, yes, it is. But the Bible tells us to be sober-minded. Amen. You know what? I don't know why some, I couldn't tell you why some Christians drink and think it's okay, but I do know uh, what the word says, and the word says to not be drunk. And, uh, you know, for those of you that have drank or ever drank before, uh, you know, it, it takes, depending on your weight, depending on a lot of different things, it, it's, it depends on what, how you get drunk or how much it takes. But uh, I, I don't, in my, you know, I don't believe uh, that uh, Christians, you know, that drink, that there's, there's an issue with that if, if you're, uh, if that's what you choose to do, I, you know, I don't think it's a position of the church to tell you whether you should drink or not. That's a conviction that you have of your own, you know, but I think we need to be careful with people that demonize people that do drink. If you're a Christian that doesn't drink for whatever reason that you don't drink, good for you. But that doesn't give you the right or the position to judge people that do drink. And, and, I, I, and to be honest with you, I just don't even know why as a church we focus on that. There's so many other things that we need to be focused on. There's so many things that we need to develop within our own life and spiritual maturity that we need to. Like, I don't understand why people are concerned with what other people are drinking. Uh, but it, unfortunately, that's what happens. And it's a standard that we use to make ourselves feel better or, or you know, we're more ahead of so-and-so. Uh, my personal opinion, I gave you my personal opinion. Uh, the Bible says to not be drunk. You know? So whether you choose to have a glass of wine, whatever you decide to do, that is up to you. That's between you and God. But what I think as Christians we need to be super careful is demonizing people that don't think the way that you think or don't practice how you practice. Or, you know, they shouldn't be there. You know, just because you can't be somewhere doesn't mean that somebody else hasn't been called to be a light in that darkness. So I think we just got to, like Pastor Vic says, you know, pay attention to your pins. Knock down your pins. Let, let people knock their pins down. Amen? All right. Uh, the next one, Pastor, since you're right there, it says, oh, this is a good one. You know, yeah, you're going to like this one. It says, should I go to a family member's homosexual wedding if they invite me? If not, how do I explain in a loving way that I will not attend? Wow, that, that, that is a complicated one. And uh, actually, my answer is a long answer, but so I want to give you the short answer. Uh, there are two positions on that. There's one that says, of course, you support your family, you love them. You know, I don't, you know, the argument is I don't go to the ceremony to celebrate, you know, that you're getting married, you know, with the same sex. I go to support you because I love you and I want you to know I'll be there for you. That's one position. The other position says by you going, you are validating, you are approving, you are 
celebrating something that is against God, you know, a marriage between a man and a woman. And Christians have different positions on that. I, I, I and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. I, I remember when I gave my life to Christ, uh, I was discipled. And one of the things I was told, you never step into a Catholic church. I, I, I did not grow up Catholic. I didn't go to Catholic church. But I would, I would go to funerals and I would go to weddings. And the instructions I got when I got saved was you never put your foot in there. Because the moment you go into the Catholic church, and at that time they still had idols. They still had statues. You are participating in the worship of idols. And I used to think, man, I go to a wedding, I don't go to worship to that church. I don't, I don't go to pay homage to the saints. I don't even go to practice. I just go because they're my friends. And, and I can remember that, that, that bothered me. And, but I didn't go because I believed them. You know, when you're a new Christian, you believe everything they tell you. But now I realize they were wrong. You know what, by going there, I'm not worshiping. It's in, in the Bible, there's a situation where in, in the church of Corinth, uh, they would offer, they would, at the temple, at, at the pagan temples, they would sacrifice animals. And part of the animal, they would offer it to the gods, to the pagan gods. And then the other half, they had a meat market there at the temple, and they would sell the meat to the people. And there were some Christians that were coming and buying meat or going to the, meat, the restaurant there at the temple and, and buying a steak dinner, and some Christians were criticizing them. You shouldn't be doing that because by doing that, you're participating in the worship of idols and the sacrifice of idols. So I, I give that long explanation to say this. I, I would recommend that you, you really think about this. And uh, I, I, I want people that I love to know that I love them and I support them. And, and you know, nothing about that's going to change my mind. However, I don't want to let them think that I'm celebrating with them something that my values are against. Angie, uh, last one that um, actually had got asked to me uh, before the service started. I didn't write it down, but it said, basically, if somebody comes into the church and they either are out there with their homosexuality or they've, uh, they want to come in and you know, be a part of the church, where do we stand as a church? If somebody wants to come in, that homosexuality and sin in our church and hear the word of God, how are we supposed to treat them? the way we treat each other. Um, this is what church is. I think we forget sometimes as Christians that the church is the hospital for sick spirits. We are all in need of the Sundays and Wednesday nights just as much as anybody else, and some people more so than us. So as they walk in through those doors, what we've been taught at Living Word and continuing to read the Word of God is that we love. We love because people are going to see God through us. And you know, you never know who's going to walk to the door, whether it's homosexual, whether it's whoever they are. You know, whatever walk they're having in life, whatever sin they're carrying, whatever burden is hurting their heart, when they come in here, you never know when somebody's coming in here and, being, and, and thinking to themselves, what is this Christianity about? What is this Jesus about? And then we are those image bearers um, of Jesus, and we show them who we are by the way we treat them. And we could put somebody off that may not walk into a church for like five more years because we, we mistreat them because for some reason, somewhere along the line, we thought our sin was better than theirs or we thought our sin was not as bad as theirs or we thought our sin is kept in such a deep, dark, deep, dark secret place that it's okay. Nobody's ever going to know our heart, but I see yours, so it's okay. I can judge you. So I would just challenge all of us to remember to not get on that high horse. And, you know, like the Pharisees in the Bible, they got so religious that they couldn't even see the miracle that Jesus did by raising Lazarus from the dead. They were so religious, they were so stuck in their re religiosity that they couldn't see this amazing miracle. And I would hate for any of us to pass that opportunity to minister to somebody, to love on somebody, because that first walk in the door might turn into somebody giving their life to Christ over two, three years, but you, you just never know. So, at the end of the day, love like Jesus loved. If Jesus was right next to us, sitting in here with us, what would he expect from us? Exactly. So good. I love that. We've, we've had many discussions behind the scenes, and even on that topic, I've shared, just like many of you, I have family members, I have really good friends that consider themselves gay, and I don't treat them any different the way I would treat you. I love them. I share with them. I share the good news. It doesn't mean I agree, like Angie said, with their sin, because guess what? Their sin is no greater than mine. A big difference and stuff and certain sins like that. A lot of times people are obviously continuing acting on their sin. And that's a whole different, 
you know, thing. If somebody was a drunk, we're going to forgive them. But if they're going to keep, like, continuing to do it, there's going to have to be times where we sit down and talk. And so, but, like Angie said, we don't treat them any different. We love on them. I have a family member, friend. She's a friend, but she's like a sister in the family. And she is literally six foot five with a full on mohawk. And man, she dresses cool, if I can say that. I wish I could dress like her. She looks awesome. But when she walks in that door, you know what you're looking at, if I can just say that. And she would come to, it was the church I was at before, she would come and literally sit right there in the front row by the pastor. And the pastor would just sit there, like kind of scared. But she was, she's the nicest lady you've ever met. And I've sat with her a million times, and she like doesn't judge us the same way we say, hey, we're not judging you. We're just asking that you evaluate yourself the same way we evaluate ourselves. Because I heard a pastor say one time, hey, you're judging this person so much, but you might be right next to them in hell because you're just so concerned about everybody else except yourself. But you know what? Like Angie said, it's our hope that anybody dealing with any type of sin, when they walk in, that one day the good news is going to hit their heart the way it hit ours and that a uh, heart of repenting uh, to come before the Lord and repent of any of our sin, that the, uh, the God that we serve is going to love us and he's faithful and just to forgive us when we repent of our sins, when we ask him for that. But it's up to them. We got to just love them and hope that love just gets through the, to their heart. Amen. Tonight we're about to end. We're a couple minutes over. But, you know, before we end, we want to make sure that if you're in this place and, and on any topic that we hit, whether it has something to do with sin, whether it has to do something, maybe if I could just say this, maybe you've had an abortion. Maybe you've been, if I can say this, maybe you've been raped. Maybe you've had your purity stolen from you. Maybe something in your life has just scarred you. And every night when you go to bed, that weighs on you. Maybe it's been years. Maybe your father did something. Maybe your uncle. Maybe somebody in school. I don't know. But all I know is that the love of God, this love that we have talked about all night, his grace on you says that you're going to be okay. He wants to make sure you know that you can be healed of those things. And you know what? A lot of times we don't know what you're going through. A lot of times only God knows. And a lot of times only you and him know. Maybe your family members, sometimes not even them. And we're not asking you to come up here and tell us every detail of anything you've been through. But we want to make sure that you know tonight, maybe tonight is your night that you need to receive that healing. Maybe you've been dealing with this for a long time and you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. You're sick and tired of going to bed and crying your eyes out, having a smile during the day in front of your coworkers and friends, but every night you go to bed with this, just this pain on your heart. Maybe you've gone through something as a kid and now you're taking it out on your spouse. And maybe there's issues in your relationship because you haven't healed from something in your past and maybe now it's, it's happening in your, in your relationships. Tonight, if that's you, right there where you are, we're just going to ask you if, you, if we could all just bow our heads and close our eyes. We don't want anybody in any way to feel embarrassed. But if that's you tonight, if you're dealing with something right there where you are, nobody looking around, nothing, if that's you in this place, if you could just raise your hand, as you, you're just giving it to God. When you raise your hand, you're just saying, God, I'm committing this to you right now. I feel this pain, but I'm giving it to you. You're just releasing it into, into the atmosphere to God. You're saying, God, I need you because I can't handle this on my own. I need your love. I need your grace. I need you to cover me. We see those hands. God sees those hands. You give it to him in a sign of faith. You're reaching out. You're saying, I'm tired of doing this on my own. God, I need you. I need you. We're going to pray for you right now and right there where you are. Just keep that hand raised. I want you to just receive his love. I want you to feel his presence right now where you're sitting. It doesn't matter if you're at home in the grocery store. Maybe you're watching online and you're raising your hand right now on your couch. God sees your hand. God knows your heart. You are putting it out there in faith that you're tired of doing it on your own. You're giving it to him. Father, we ask right now, let your love just cover them, God. Father, let your peace that surpasses all understanding, let, let it overwhelm their life right now, God. May they feel you right now in this moment. Father, you said to cast our cares upon you because you care for us, God. Father, we're doing so right now in this moment. We're giving it to you. God, that hurt that we feel, Father, we ask that you would heal it. Father, that judgmental spirit that we have towards others because something that happened in our life, Father, we ask that you would change our hearts right now with that. Father, that anger that rises up on the inside of us because the way a man treated somebody, the way a woman treated somebody, the way we were treated, God, Father, we cast that anger down right now. 
Father, we ask for your peace. We ask for your joy. Your word says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Father, give us that joy. Give us that joy reminding us of all you've done for us, how you've healed us, Father, how you've been there for us. You've restored those things. And right now we're giving it to you, God. We're giving it to you. And Father, for any of those, any of us that are in here that are dealing with any kind of sin, Father, any of us dealing with that, Father, we want to just give it to you right now. We want to ask you right now, Father, if you're sitting in your seat, you just ask him, God, forgive me. Forgive me, Father. You know what I've done. You know the sins I've been committing. You know what I struggle with. You know the temptations I struggle with, God. Father, I ask that you would help clear our mind. Help us to resist that temptation. Help, help us to resist the devil when he tries to throw things our way, God. Help us, Lord. And Father, for anybody in this place that maybe hasn't had that relationship with you, if that's you, you just give your heart to God right now. You just ask him, God, come back into my heart. God, help me to walk stronger with you like I once did. And if you never have, ask him into your heart for the first time tonight because he's willing and he's able. But he's not going to do it on his own. He wants you to ask him. He wants you to allow him, to let him into your heart. He's not rude. He's not going to force himself into your heart. He wants you to ask him. So ask him right there where you are. God, come into my heart. Restore those things, God. Help me to walk closer with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. So, Father, we just thank you for tonight, God. We thank you for your presence being here with us tonight. Lord, we honor you in all that we do. Father, we're thankful for a church that can come in and we can have a service like this to have a Q&A with tough, tough uh, subjects, tough questions, God. But we're so grateful that as a church that we're here for the people. We're here for one another. And nobody, not even on this stage, none of us are perfect, God. But Father, but with you, Father, we know that we're loved. We know that we're forgiven. We know that we're healed. We're restored, Father. All those, all those blessings that you've promised us, God, we are. And so, God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for all you've done on the hearts of your people, healing that took place, God. Father, we thank you for the testimonies that are going to come out tonight. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen, amen. Well, we are so thankful that you were here with us tonight. Man, I hope next Wednesday it's this pack too because it's usually not. So I'm going to encourage you to come back next Wednesday as well. But hey, let's not miss out. Yeah, there you go. Let's not miss out this Sunday once again. Pastor is starting his new series in the in the book of John, First John. And Caleb doesn't know the title, but it's Authentic Christianity. And it's going to be good. It's going to be through the month. So make sure you invite your family and friends and we'll see you Sunday. But we love you guys. We'll see you Sunday at 830 or 10 o'clock. God bless you all. Have a good night.